All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. So thank you all so much for joining us today for the third installment of our Abney Borger Breakfast Series. Um, we're very lucky to have a special guest with us today in honor of Women's History Month, um, the amazing Hunter President Jennifer J. Rabb. Um, before I kick it off to our amazing host, Laura Montross, um, just want a reminder, um, we encourage you all to stay on camera. This, this is in a meeting format. Um, and, you know, we'd love to see your faces. Um, at the end of the moderated Q&A, we'll leave some time for audience questions. And um, the way that we'll do that will be interactive. Um, so raise your hand or ping me in the chat and we'll call on you um, and we'll have you ask the questions live. So, um, you know, you can either put your question in the chat or just save it for later, um, but we'll queue you up. Um, you know, please, uh, spread the ABNY word as always at a better NY on all socials. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll pass it to our amazing steering committee member, um, director of communications at Brookfield Properties, Laura Montross. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah. And to everyone who joined us this morning, we're so happy to be here. Um, I'll be it virtually, but we'll, we'll be back in person soon. So uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Laura Montross. As Sarah mentioned, I am the Director of Communications at Brookfield Properties and a proud member of the Young Professional Steering Committee here at ABNY. Um, so welcome everyone to Boardroom Breakfast. As some of you may already know, this is a program exclusive for the ABNY YP Associates and a sub-series of our popular Boardroom Breakfast series, which hopefully some of you have attended to historically. Um, each session of the Boardroom Breakfast features a conversation with an ABNY board member or ABNY Foundation trustee. And today, we are so lucky to have with us uh, President Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College. So I will do just a brief bio on President Rabb, and then we'll dive right into the Q&A. Um, but she is such an incredibly impressive figure, and um, I want to ensure everyone knows what that sounds like. So under uh, per President Rabb's tenure, Hunter has transformed into a highly selective, top-ranked college, and today we will hear from her about the past efforts she's taken during her tenure and what the future looks like for institution. Jennifer Rabb is the 13th president of Hunter College. It's the largest college of the City University of New York system. Since her tenure began in 2001, President Rob has been responsible for ra raising more than $400 million in philanthropic support for Hunter College. The Princeton Review ranks Hunter among the best schools in the nation and has hailed Hunter as a crown jewel of the CUNY system. Now, as a leader in public higher education, President Rob continues her long career in public service, from being a lawyer to a political campaign advisor to a government official. So President Rob previously served as a litigator at two of the nation's most prestigious law firms, Cravath, Swain and & Moore, and Paul Weiss, Rivkin, Warren, and Garrison. Now, quickly earning a reputation as a strong but fair advocate, she was appointed chairman of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, where she was known for her effective and innovative leadership on the agency that protects and preserves the city's historic structures and architectural heritage. President Robb is a graduate of Hunter College High School. She received a BA with distinction in all subjects from Cornell University, an MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, and JD Cum Laude from Harvard Law School. That is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of her accomplishments, but I think I'd rather talk to them, talk to President Robb about them rather than just ranting myself. Um, so I'm gonna dive right in. First of all, President Robb, again, thank you so much. Um, my first question for you, Princeton Review ranks schools, but I think you and I can both agree Hunter College is the best school in the world. Uh, so why do, you, why do you think that is? Yes, you got my job there. Um, first of all, thank <laughs> you for that lovely introduction. All of you, thank you for having me this morning, spending some time, and for all you do as young professionals at ABNY. I love this group, and I'm so glad you're all part of it. Um, Hunter gives our students an absolutely priceless education at a price students can afford. And I think many of you are very close to that point where you may still be paying back student loans. Um, we are talking about in this country a time where we're, gonna, we're getting to a point of being 
pricing people out of getting a great education. But it's not just the price point. There's nothing we don't offer at Hunter. We have all the sciences. So you can work with a scientist who does breast cancer research or works with uh, elephant behavior in Thailand. In social sciences, we do human rights, environmental, public policy. We have all the arts from theater, dance, writing, painting. And then we train one out of every 10 public school teachers, the city's social workers, the city's nurses. So it's this incredible education and our diversity. 20% of our students not born in this country are children of immigrants, first generation. And it's more than just you know, where people come from, but their backgrounds. Some may be 18 year olds right from high school, sitting next to a 35 year old a person who came to New York and is now finishing their college degree, or a senior auditor who's 60 years old and brings a whole other level of experience. And all of that in this incredible city in Manhattan, right near the hospitals, the museums, Central Park. So putting it all together, you just can't get a better package. And that's why we love what we do. I think that's a compelling case. I completed my undergrad, but I would very willingly go, go at it again. Uh, at Hunter College. That's a great master's program, particularly in urban affairs. And so please all, everyone take a look. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, so remind me, you joined uh, Hunter College in 2001, is that right? 2001, 20 year anniversary, um, out, uh, getting on 21. So it's, uh, I may be one of the longest serving president, college presidents in America. <laughs> Incredible. Um, so let's take us back to 2001, if you can remember some of those early days, weeks, months at the institution. Um, when you joined, what were the top two, three issues that you found that you wanted to tackle with the school? And then maybe can you pick one of those issues and walk through over the past 20 years how you've taken it on and, and set out to solve it? A uh, really interesting question. And Laura, I think maybe I'll start with sort of why did I, how did I get here? Because yeah. I think for people, it's like, obviously I did not take a traditional route to becoming a college president. And it's related to what I came to achieve. Um, as you mentioned, I was the chairman of the Landmarks Commission and I felt confident that I had done two things I think are important in running an institution. I had honed public management skills in running an agency, but also public leadership skills and having a vision and bringing people along. Um, and I was trying to think, where do I bring those skills? New York is my obsession, like many of you. I wanted to keep giving back. What was the next step? And then I, a crazy thing happened. And I, I wanted to say that because I think if any of you, some one day have a crazy idea about what you can be or where you can go, just remember this story. I opened the New York Times and I saw that the president of Hunter College was leaving. And I went, I had a moment back to my childhood because it was on the corner of 68th Street and Lexington at Hunter College where my life really began in terms of professional trajectory. I was 12 years old. I was the youngest of four children in a really poor household. My father died when I was very young. And they told me I could take the Hunter College High School test. And I got on a bus with my number two pencil, got on the number four bus, got to Hunter College, took the test, and was admitted to this very rigorous education where no matter where you came from, it didn't matter your background, what kind of money, what kind of education your family had, you were gonna succeed and you were gonna go to college. And that was a formative experience for me. And I felt like I could bring that back to that corner. I could come back to Hunter and inspire a next generation in a college setting. And for policy wonks on this call, and I know a lot of you are, um, it was a really interesting time in education in New York. In this 1970s, there was a decision in 1969-70 that the colleges in CUNY, the senior colleges, would go from a selective admission to open admissions. And that the idea was that we'd get more people coming to college if we just let everyone come to college and get people ready to be in college when they were there. And this turned out to be it was a, sort of a, a well-intended idea, but it wound up really being very difficult to implement because so many people weren't ready and it was hard to serve people who were ready and others who weren't. 
which is why now we have the successful community colleges where people can transfer. So it was a difficult time. And then the city went through the fiscal crisis. My friend uh, Bob Lehrman's here. He can certainly remember that. And we the resources. There was a, just a total collapse. The state picked up CUNY. And then over the next 20 years, huge disinvestment in this system. So this crazy idea of maybe someone from outside, maybe someone who didn't have a traditional trajectory could come in and bring change, I think turned out to be go from a crazy brash. And I would say, you know, it's a little bit of an arrogant idea. It turned out to be effective. And what did I want was the big goal? The big goal was to bring back the luster of Hunter College, to make this a place that people wanted to go to, that had the resources to succeed, that the students felt really proud of where they were, that the faculty felt proud. And I do feel 20 years later, we did get there. Um, and you know, to give you a few examples within that, you say, how, what did you pick? One of the issues is in, in American higher education, many of us have been lucky to go to college for four years and to graduate. But that's not the case really in America. We think that's sort of a television view of college, but only 60% of Americans will graduate high school and go to college. And only 60% of that 60% will graduate in six years. And that's the number we use. We use it's six years is really the graduation rate. Why? Because people have financial issues. They have family responsibilities. When are classes available? So that's the number we look at. And in a very strategic way, the numbers at CUNY were really abysmal. And even at a place like Hunter, we only had a 35% graduation rate. And the national average, as I said, is 60%. So that was one of those data driven, we knew that's the number. So mm -hmm. I put a big 60 over my bed mm -hmm. and I said, we are going to get there. And we created so like a war room and it was everything from admissions to raising money for scholarships, for better teaching, improve facilities, get a better library. There were 30 different sub goals, but that was one very big goal and I'm, I wish I could say we're at 60, but we're at 59% and we're going to get there. So that was the type of thing was very specific. Yeah. And then I'd say too quickly, others were more amorphous, which was, which are useful, I think, to think about those of you going into leadership careers. Second was really sort of a morale. Like we just had, we had a place that people, they didn't, they didn't feel appreciated and loved. The system had really spiraled down. So I really brought the sense of we can do this, we are going to be a great institution and just kept pulling, when people sunk back, pulling them forward. And the third also part of that sort of leadership was it's fundraising, but it's really resource and partnership and reputation raising. And that's what I set out to do was to connect, whether it was with a former alum to get a donation or with Melva and her predecessors to say, wait, can we send Abney interns? Can we do programs with Abney? So everybody in New York needed to be a part of Hunter College to, so we could all raise up. And you know, so those are some of the bigger picture goals that I had 20 years ago. And and we, you know, we still have them. <laughs> yeah. No, I think by nature of the fact that the school is smack dab in the middle of Manhattan, it feels at, at the one hand, so obvious that there right. is a boundless amount of resources, but then the, the technical execution of getting those resources and utilizing them is a monumental task. So I applaud you for that. Um, you've mentioned the word leadership a couple of times. I think I myself over the past two years of the pandemic have laid awake at night thinking, <laughs> what would I do if I were in a position of of you know, profound authority, whether I was overseeing a massive university or a government body or a giant company, um, what, what a test of leadership it would be to go through such a, a period of crisis. And I was hoping you could talk to us just sort of personally about your leadership style and maybe where you honed it or did it come naturally or kind of what, how do you, how do you describe your leadership style? So that's one of those interesting questions that it, I think when I started, we didn't talk about it as much. And now it's become more of a, you know, sort of a catchphrase. And sometimes I feel like it's like that interview question, like, what are your weaknesses? And yeah. you have to prepare an answer. There's no great 
one, right? I work too hard sometimes, exactly. and I'm <laughs> uh, exactly so. Um, and I and I think you go. We're talking about the pandemic and leadership. So, it's stepping back, I think one thing that's been consistent over twenty years is really being fearless, like saying we have a goal and we're going to get there, and that setting that so that people feel like we can do this, like we're not going to be stopped has really helped everybody at Hunter, whether it's students finishing their degrees or you know the staff and faculty turning the institution around. And, but that was, a, that kind of drive did, as you said, have to be honed in this very different kind of world of a pandemic. So I would, you know, I stepped back. This was really a third crisis that I had to lead and manage through. I started June 11th, 2001. On September 11th, I could see from my windows a, you know, a little t uh, sign of, of smoke downtown because you can see all the way down. So that there's a lot less technology. I had this institution here that we had students that had to get home. We had people worried about their families. We were all just reeling. We run a K through 12. I had kindergarten kids who weren't getting picked up by parents because they were missing. I mean, it was an unbelievable. And then there were the aftermath, the, the shock we were all in and the impact on the on both our emotions and our finances. So I felt I had one of the ways I honed leadership skills here was that I was very present during that crisis and we made decisions and we thought about, we both moved forward, but also memorialized the tragedy. So I had had that as a basis. I then had to lead through Sandy and we were really hit here. Um, our dorm, we have a campus on 25th street that was totally underwater. It's on the FDR drive. And we had a dorm of 600 kids who didn't have a place to go home to the next day, as well as our whole nursing school that had to move uptown. And we had skeletons in my conference room for our physical therapist. And we, so we lived through that part of New York's tragedy. So there was some basis for this sense of crisis. And, but in this crisis, we, I think we learned, I learned another, a sort of a gent, kinder, gentler sense of, we really had to think about what people were going through emotionally. And you alluded to that. So we had to move forward. You know, on March 11th, 2020, the governor, we, we turned on our televisions and the governor announced CUNY was going remote in 10 days. So in 10 days, we were putting 3000 classes online and we had to immediately make sure our students had computers and that our faculty had the technology to teach. But each layer was a new question. You, yes, you, students said they had a computer, but it turned out they had to share the computer with their rest of their siblings. It turned out the computer didn't have the right Wi-Fi and broadband, it didn't have a camera. Faculty, they have a computer, but it turns out they didn't actually know how to use Zoom. And people were you know, sometimes teaching with the top of their heads. So we had a showing rather than their faces. So each, level required sort of patience and understanding. Now we're going to get you the right technology. Now we're going to help teachers learn how to teach on Zoom and students learn how to learn better on Zoom. We had to get, we did things from getting food pantries open to getting food out to our kids in neighborhoods. So it was this sense of what are people's, how do we keep our community together? How do we do the best we can? Understanding it wasn't going to be perfect, but we needed to really listen to people. And more than ever, I think I pushed decision making out in a very diffuse way. So I needed the dance department to tell us, how do you best teach dance on Zoom? And they said to us, you know, it would be really helpful if you sent dance bars out to people's houses so they could, well, who would think of that? Not here in a central room, but they told us, what do we need? And we we listen to people. And it's the same thing in coming back now. We've given them people autonomy. When are people coming back? How are you doing the split schedules? What works in teaching? What works hybrid? What should come back on campus? So much more diffuse decision-making in a crisis because you really need to listen to the people who are the closest to the problems to find the solutions. And I'm very proud though. I just want to end by saying, 70% of our classes are back, but 93% of our students have at least one class. 
So we're packed and it's beautiful to see people back. And I do have to say, you know, in terms of lessons learned for many years, people would come to us in higher ed and say, don't invest in new buildings. You know, you don't need them. There's going to be MOOCs. There's going to be Coursera. It'll all be on computers. Why are you, why do you want a new building? That turned out to be absolutely wrong. Like it turns <laughs> out that people really love to be in rooms together to learn and to talk and to converse. And yes, we learned a lot about how technology can connect us with students who have, don't have to commute for a 15 minute meeting on financial aid. Like there's a lot of uses we've learned, but the core of certainly K through 12 education, and I think mostly higher education is interactive being together. And we're very happy to be doing so now. That's great. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I, was, I come into the office five days a week, but today, I was thinking about the possibility of working from home and I go back and forth. It's such an emotional decision when given the choice, I'm lucky to even have the choice, but I showed up this morning, had a coffee with my coworker, chatted with my boss, collaborated on a project and immediately even an hour in, I was like, okay, I'm glad I came in. It's, <laughs> you know, given the opportunity to do it, very lucky to have the choice. Um, so you've had a long career in both the private sector and the public sector. That is you know, traditional in some senses, but untraditional in others. Some people graduate from college, go into finance, go into banking, and never see a day in government for their entire lives. And some people sign up as a campaign staffer at age 20, and they're a campaign staffer at age 80. So <laughs> you, on the other hand, have done both. I have dabbled in both and found them to be remarkably different experiences. And I'd be curious if you feel that way. What what has what do you think are sort of the defining characteristics of working in the private sector versus working in the public sector? And what did you kind of like or take away from either? So fascinating question. And I would recommend to everyone listening that people follow Laura's example. It's a very smart thing to try to do both because I think you you learn. A lot. One thing I feel very strongly about, and it'd be interesting, Melva, in terms of our, you know, Abney group, I think the leadership and management skills in the public sector are undervalued. I think people don't actually understand how difficult it is to lead and manage in a public system. It's sort of like, oh, the private sector, the gold standard. Um, it's incredibly challenging when everything is transparent. Now, transparency is great but an average business person can have a meeting and send a memo and they're not gonna get foiled on what they said, right? So the, the ability, everything in public is public and the disclosure, how much people make and what they say, that's a challenge in management. Um, you know, I'm a big supporter of unions, but managing in a unionized setting is different than managing in a non-unionized setting where there clearly is more flexibility in terms of hiring and changing personnel and moving people around. So that's a huge difference. And, you know, the legal strains on public, you know, the liability, all of that is, is just, it's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing because you feel your impact, you feel your impact, um, but it is very, very complex. Um, I also think some of the kind of this truisms that aren't true in the private sector that, oh, it's so much more efficient. Well, there's a, you know, you're shaking your head, you agree, yeah. but, it's not, but, it is, but it's one of those, you know, things we're told, oh, private sector capital, you know, the, the financial system efficient. Well, it's not, there are times when it's not at a, as efficient at all, but there is something that I did, I think it's true and that I've really learned that, you know, the focus, the financial focus in the private sector, that time is money. And that, you know, you have to value people's investments, whether it's in business or as practicing as a lawyer, we build by the 15 second interval. So every 15 minutes I spent on something that was built out to a client, you really get a great sense against waste and, and for productivity and for valuing investment. So sometimes in the public sector, I've been in that position to really say, and I, and I translate it this way, that somebody worked today as a school teacher and she or he paid his ta their taxes and those taxes are supporting our salaries. So we better well get this job done today because somebody is paying for our time. So I translated some of those pub private sector values of really about you know of, of the value of money and what you're paying for. And I've tried to bring them into the public sector to hold people to a standard. You can't 
you can't waste taxpayer money. And I think I learned that principle very much from being in the private sector. I think Laura's frozen. <laughs> uh, oh. I'll give her a second, but if not, I have a copy of her question so I can line up the next one. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Oh, she's gone. We'll just give her a minute. Sorry, everyone. She's back there. She is. Oh, great. Okay. Don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. You know, while well, it took a little pause, I was thinking of one interesting thing, Laura, that, um, you know, I've been on a public board for a public company. And I remember when I was interviewing for that position as a board member and everyone, most of the pe other people on the board were CEOs of other public, you know, public companies. Right. And I could see they were pigeonholing me as a public sector employee, right. Oh, college president. And I had to sort of say, wait, no, I'm really a CEO too. Right. Like I'm managing thousands of people. I have this, you know, multi-million dollar budget, I have labor issues, legal issues, crisis communications. Like, what about this isn't being a private CEO? So, I, as I said, I'm a little bit on a soapbox of appreciation for public management <laughs> skills. Yeah. No, I think I, in, in coming into the private sector over this past year, you know, real estate and government are very close. They interact all the time. And I have a lot of colleagues who've worked in real estate their entire lives, essentially. And they have a lot of frustration towards government and bureaucracy. And, just sort of not talk down about it, but maybe have a, a bit more judgmental about its efficiencies. And my port sort of position on it has been historically, like, I promise you, there are incredibly smart people in government. And if you, and also incredibly smart person, if you were to join government, you would find it extremely challenging. It's not as if there's a bunch of idiots running around with chickens with their heads cut off in there. It just is challenging. There's smart people trying to solve difficult things. And so I have a, a soapbox. A lot of constraints <laughs> that sometimes you don't have in the private sector. So it's it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're both great. Um, so moving on, um, obviously you have an extremely rigorous day job. You're also involved in ABNY. So can you talk to us about kind of when and why you first got involved in ABNY? I feel like I've probably always had that Abney t-shirt. Um, and I know I started when I when I left, and again, it comes back to when I left uh, the city to come to Hunter, I really knew that a public college in New York just can't succeed if it's not really connected to the fabric of this city. So the idea that I could go once a month to meetings with people from all the, you know, whether it was real estate private or city government or the unions or the communications industry, and I could be there and I could, you know, brag about Hunter there, but also hear what are the trends? What are people doing? What are the other parts of this, this, the arts world, the, the nonprofit world, the government? That was a place for me, for Hunter, what a great place for me to be, to learn and be part of that conversation. So I joined the Avenue Steering Committee, I think the minute I got here mm -hmm. and I've been part of it since. And it's, and it's proven, that has proven to be true. I mean, I think we all laugh like with the pandemic, not having, it's nice to have the, you know, some of the Zoom meetings that Melva does so well, but I think we really all miss the coffee hour. Because the, and I urge all of you, when you're thinking about things, it is one of the best uses of your time to go to coffee hours, cocktail parties, like that's where the work gets done. Okay. I mean, somebody gave me the best advice when I started that they said, sometimes if you go to a dinner, you're seated and it's a long time. And particularly if you're a working parent, you want to go home, see your kids, go to the cocktail party and go from one corner to the other then go crisscross around the corner and you will, by the time you finish, you have seen everybody. You would have, you have solved seven problems, made 30 deals and just, then you can go home. <laughs> That's incredible. Well, I know I miss, I miss a good cocktail party, but they're, they're starting, they're starting to come back a little bit. Um, so in it, you sat on the Abney steering committee and now you are a member of the Abney foundation board. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So what's the differentiation for those of us who don't understand? 
So in the Abney, we're talking about where Abney's putting its efforts and what kind of programming we're doing, you know, investing in YP and having speakers and other initiatives, the census. The foundation is we're responsible to help Melva make investments from Abney into nonprofit initiatives. So Melva's done the really, and, and the whole team have done a brilliant job of lining up our philanthropy to Abney's goals. So we really, for the first time now, have very specific, we're focusing on public safety. We will make investments in nonprofits that are doing things in public safety or the arts. So Abney has some general goals. We're trying to bring this, help the city recover from the pandemic. The foundation takes the money we raise in our front and some of our fundraisers and other ways that we get philanthropy. And then we're responsible for investing that money in the things that are gonna help the city come back. Okay. And it's very fun because you get to see, you know, you're often we're talking about big organizations, but Melva has brought us just so many grassroots organizations that have brilliant ideas. And it's such a rewarding, and you can invest $10,000 and help someone make a difference in a neighborhood and then see where that idea goes and it can inform change throughout the city. That's incredible. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I was as well versed as to what the foundation board did. And now I know. So, so fascinating. Um, do you, Dr. Rob, do you sit on any other boards in the city? So I've, over the years, I've been involved with a lot of nonprofit boards. I was on United Way. I did work with something called Humanity in Action that helps students study human rights. I mean, just over my career, I was part of the After School Corporation, which for many years helped, you know, support, I say, after school and enhanced learning. Um, and I really recommend to all of you if you have an opportunity to join a nonprofit board, even if it's the junior board of a nonprofit, seize it. Um, it's an amazing, first of all, it's another great networking tool. I've loved, you know, I love the mission of the groups I've been involved with, but then you also have fun and meet people. And I think Melva, even in our little Abney Foundation board, we have a good time and we, we've grown relationships. So if you have that opportunity, it lets you help give back, obviously. But it also, it gives you a networking ability and you watch something, governance. And I'd say, Laura, you know, one of the things that I think all of you should think about is this, you know, this idea of how do organizations run? So nonprofit boards are responsible for the, you know, overseeing, not operating, not doing the work, but overseeing the work of nonprofits, you know, they're by, and looking to make sure the money is allocated appropriately. And this governance idea whether it's in a public company, which I also did, or nonprofits, is a wonderful way to be involved. And it's a whole different aspect of, of being engaged from doing the work, being in this oversight capacity on a governing board. So I yeah. urge you, any if you ever have an opportunity, you're asked to be a member, you know, because a lot of boards want junior membership and you have less of an obligation to actually fundraise or contribute, but your presence is really important. And we, one of the boards I'm most involved with is we have a Hunter College Foundation and we're in, you know, charged with raising money for the school. And we have now oh, about three or four pretty recent five or six year out alums on the board. And it's dynamite to have younger people and younger voices in our group helping us run this foundation. That's incredible. Um, so I'm going to ask, I guess, one more question, and then we're going to switch over to audience Q&A. Um, we've talked a bit of today about public sector, private sector, um, the role of government, the role of CEOs, et cetera. And you and I and everyone on this call and anyone involved in ABNY have a, a, a probably a unhealthy obsession with New York City and its future and its progress and all of those things. So we have a new mayoral administration, a new city council. Um, what what do you think? What what do you think is the most important issue the mayor should be attending to right now? Um, sort of what's what's your big what's your big takeaway from what's about to happen? I think big question of the day and I know I think many obvious answers people talk about public safety because the ever that hits every part of the city but my personal obsession is k-12 education and asking the mayor and the administration and the council to really give the ability the resources the authority for the doe to make improvements in the public school system um 
the pandemic had, you know, an unbelievable impact on young people's learning. We need to bring this, this, this kids back to school. We've got to deal with the social emotional learning impact that this pandemic had on young people. And there were many issues before the pandemic in the DOE. So I, with, without a healthy public school system, I worry about New York. Obviously it's the DOE who sends Hunter and CUNY our wonderful students, but it's really the foundation of our future. And if we're not providing a stellar education and New York has always done that, we've always had one of the finest public school systems. But when you see people leaving that system and they leave New York, you know, private schools are extremely expensive and people start to walk with their feet and leave the city. And we just can't afford that now. So it's one of the great democratizing institutions. It's just one of the beauties of our, of our city is that we've had this diverse, important, strong public school system. And we've got to make the investments both financially, but I think just in terms of policy wise in getting the schools back to be strong institutions again. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I, was, I was on the transition committee. I was very privileged that, to be a part of that group. And, you know, I know that I think they have a wonderful new chancellor and they're really making, really focusing on the hard work to do that. But, and I wish them really the best. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll pay closer attention to that issue. Now I've, I've been followed some of the transition committee work and have been carefully following the first couple of months, but, um, sincerely care about the education as well. So appreciate you bringing that to our attention. Um, actually, you know, I'll do one final question and then we're gonna, sorry, I'm hogging the Q and A, but um, yeah, I would be remiss to acknowledge that it is Women's History Month. Uh, that right, yeah, Women's History Month. So um, President Rob, is, do you mind telling us maybe a story or, or about a woman who has been most influential in your life? So always interesting. I want to give a little plug on Women's History Month um, that Hunter was the ninth school in the United States to accept women into higher education. I just think, and we're very proud of that history. Um, and Thomas Hunter is actually kicked out of Ireland because he was too progressive. And he came here and he said that it was basically women shouldn't leave you know, at 13 or 14 graduate and then come back in two weeks as teachers, that they should have two years of content learning, a year of pedagogy, and then he's quote, a clinical experience, which is when we started Hunter Elementary. So we were in what they called a normal school, a school for teachers, but we, it was this unbelievably empowering experience for women to be told they could be in higher education and all women, he had old fashioned language, but he wrote in his autobiography that in his school, the Jew will sit next to the Negro, who will sit next to the Christian. And that, that was unheard of in 1870. And we have, we have some of the incredible history of educating some of the most powerful black women civil rights advocates in the world. Ruby Dee, Audre Lorde, Pauli Murray, they all went to Hunter because they were valued and accepted. Italian, Irish, Jewish immigrants. I mean, amazing access, even at that time, we're the only school in the world to have two women Nobel winners in medicine. So we're very, very proud of that. And I'd say one of the things that's been a real privilege to me is restoring the house of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will say, you know, you remember Franklin was the president. I'm like, I know he was the president, but I don't think he, we all know Franklin Roosevelt would not have been a successful president without Eleanor Roosevelt being his eyes and ears. So for Women's History Month, um, I would love to honor Eleanor Roosevelt. And I'd like to give her one of my, my favorite quotes from her, which is women are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they are until they're in hot water. <laughs> I, um, I grew up in a family with three older sisters and my mom. So there was five women, I essentially had four moms, but my mom would tell us, her, I think her icon, her the woman she looked up to most was Eleanor Roosevelt as well. So that that <laughs> resonates for me. Um, she was incredible. So I, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to the audience Q and A. It sounds like we have two folks who joined us who have some questions. So um, Yannick Williams, if you are on and able to turn your audio on, I will hand over the mic to you. 
Thank you so much, Laura. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. Amazing. Awesome. Great to see everyone's beautiful face this morning. Um, just amazing to join with you all. Um, President uh, Rab, thank you so much. Jennifer, it's been great just hearing from you and your responses. Um, my name is Yannick Williams. I'm a technologist. I specialize in information security and data privacy. I've spent several years on Wall Street. Um, in addition to that, I'm also the founder of a company called Young Ambitious One. It's a learning and career development company company where we really focus on empowering the next generation of leaders in business, tech, and entrepreneurship. My question for you, Jennifer, is, um, is Hunter College open to collaborating with startups and businesses to provide additional learning and career development opportunities? We've seen several things like tech boot camps, um, entrepreneurship programs, career accelerators really take off at other schools that we've been working with as well. And just sort of the trajectory for students looking to get into technology, business and entrepreneurship. Um, what's your take on, on Hunter kind of exploring those types of opportunities and expanding um, learning and development for the students. Well, I think you just joined our, I can't decide if you joined our business advisory board or our computer science business <laughs> board <laughs> so we'll offline later. Yeah. Uh, first, I think the general question is all of us in higher ed, Unique, must now, and we, and we have now just committed to this in our strategic plan, we need to worry about where are students going the minute she comes into our door as a freshman. And we are now, we all know that. Okay. Devil in the details, we've got to do a better job. At Hunter, we believe in a liberal arts education. We think that in some ways, we're never going to guess the job of 20 years from now, right? Like whoever thought, right, that you'd be getting a mattress in a box and you'd be living on Zoom and you can't mm -hmm. even imagine the things that have happened. So we believe in core skills, you know, teaching people to quantitative work, qualitative reasoning, communication, critical thinking. But we also know we've got to make sure people are leaving, particularly with some level of technology skills and also some sense of the business world and how it works. So we're adding those. We actually made a commitment with the city to double the number of computer science majors five years ago, and we've hit that number. So we're very interested in talking. But I think the real takeaway is that all of higher ed is beginning to understand you can't just have a career center somewhere in a corner that maybe brushes up your resume and most of the kids don't even know where it is. Mm -hmm. so right now, we're having a conversation at Hunter about putting our career service in our library. So you just, you can't miss it, right? And then having people like you giving workshops, talking to students, what are the options and what skills do you need to get as a student to be able to get a job. And the final thing is for all of you, I come internships, students, we know that that's a key and we need the members of ABNY and everyone to think about what kind of internship opportunities you can offer our students, what kind of career talks you can come give our students. They, so many first generation college goers don't even know about the what job you have, Laura, what you do, what's a real estate company. And we need to work together to let our students know what the options are and for companies like yours to see the skills that you have in a CUNY because we're really the economic generator. We're training your employees and we need to have these partnerships. So yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> amazing, amazing. I love the complete response. Thank you so much, Jennifer, amazing. Thank you, Unique. Um, I'll hand it over to Dave Copeland if you're able to turn your mic on. Hi, uh, my name is Lily Copeland. I, I graduated from Hunter about a decade ago. I've since taught there as an adjunct. I'm a very big Hunter fan, so thank you for creating a wonderful space and, and you know, your leadership. Um, I have two questions, and I currently work at Moody's. I, I have two questions. You're, uh, also, found, you're also found, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, one of my questions is about what your thoughts are on the role of Hunter in the city's economic recovery and in the city's labor market. Um, and my other question is about um, CUNY and Hunter being recognized on a national level for economic mobility um, and what you and other people, members of the administration are aware of and, and sort of how you think that plays into the, your strategy in leading Hunter. Um, so starting with the first, I think that we've been doing well, but I think David, we have to do better in actually connecting the city and more planning with the, with the university. Um, one of the things that the de Blasio administration 
did, and I was mentioning this to Unique, is, is create this program called CUNY 2X. And they, the city made a very significant investment in selected CUNY colleges to do a couple of things. And, but it, what we, the colleges had to be able to perform. And the first was to actually radically adjust our computer science curriculums. So we were training students in the types of things, you, types of jobs you wanna hire. So that's, it's very, you know, those are challenging conversations as you know, as an adjunct to tell a faculty member what you should be teaching. So it was an interesting, real change to bring in experts and say, hey, look, you're teaching this, but you know what the companies want? It's this, right? So that we brought in people, we embedded them in our faculty, we changed curriculum. And then they gave us support to create entry level internships in software engineering. And I have to be honest, and I you know, think I was saying this to you, Laura, about the public private split. I was a little reluctant when I first heard that. Should we be taking taxpayer dollars and giving them to startups to hire interns? Like, wait, isn't that, is that a, is that a good use of public money to give to the private sector? And it turns out the answer is absolutely yes, because Moody's and Google and, you know, are not hiring a student from Hunter in software engineering. But if they have that first level internship, David, where they're with a startup and they can show they can work in teams and they get a good evaluation, we've had great luck with our students getting these top level software engineering jobs. So this was just an example of a city, a very, it was funded through the Small Business Administration federally, came to the city and the, and the, and the Blasey administration created this CUNY 2X with the pipeline of jobs and creating changes in curriculum. And I, I think that was a, it was a brilliant move and it created change that we will now institutionalize. So I would turn back, what are the, to all of you, what are the programs the city can devise that are true partnerships with CUNY? What industries are growing in New York? Where do you need labor and how do you need the labor educated? And again, I believe in the critical skills of, of, lot of reasoning and writing and communication. I, don't, I want to support liberal arts and what you studied with us, David, but what about the skills? And where's that match where employers are telling the city, you know, Moody's is only staying here if we can hire X, Y, Z. And then the city has to come to CUNY and say, listen, you've got to do a better job. I mean, Unique, you're talking technology. We all know, for example, cybersecurity, huge industry growth. Well, that's something we're looking at. How do we do more programs? Because we know the city is going to be starved for that kind of talent. Um, so I think it's all, and it's not just in tech. We have a new arts management program where you can, where we said to theater majors, listen, follow your passion. You want to be an actor, that's great. But you want to get a job, maybe we'll teach you a little bit of accounting, a little finance, some legal concepts so you can go work in a theater nonprofit because maybe you're not gonna make it on Broadway, right? So, you know, we're trying to instill skills that are transferable to industry. And on economic mobility, I think we, CUNY just always knocks it out of the park in every national study. And it's just amazing um, what we do to raise people up. I mean, Hunter, it's sometimes, you know, for me, the city will always come up on the top and Baruch, why? Because they judge that by how much money you make. And we're not, we're sending people out to be software engineers and accountants, but we're also sending them out to be poets and planners and nonprofit workers and city government and, you know, Broadway, uh, you know, administrators. So, you know, we don't always have the highest paid uh, alums because they're so varied and so many New York jobs, but the mobility for all the CUNY institutions is incomparable, I think, in the country. Thank you very much. And we look forward to come home to Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, David. I will hand the mic over now to Asaya Piper, if you're on. Hi, apologies that my camera isn't on. I'm still recovering from a cold. Um, thank you so much, President Raff, for your insightful wisdom. Um, so I just had a question. Um, so let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Asaya Piper. I am a community coordinator um, here on behalf of National Grid. 
Um, I just had a question, um, especially from a leader perspective. So I come from Clarkson University. Um, he, our president was actually one of the long, one of the longest standing presidents um, um, in college history too. So I do understand that there is many waves and challenges that come from that and it only makes a person stronger. So absolutely giving you all the accolades and roses that you deserve. So my question is, how do you maintain and boost morale and motivation within an organization? especially in the midst of pandemic, because um, um, the pandemic has also been known as the great resignation across several industries due to the in, um, increase in ongoing challenges, right, with people working from home, as well as um, just competing with the new generation of the workforce that's coming in. So how do you push that motivation and retain um, the, you know, the true talent and essence of an of, of a organization going forward? Oh, that is a brilliant question. And I actually think Melva should really be a subject of a big Abney talk. Cause I think I didn't necessarily want to see the truth in what you're saying. I wanted to think, oh, everybody's gonna come back and we won't see these changes, but we've started to see them too. And sometimes I found, wait, if you're not coming back to work, where are you going? Um, you know, I've had, I've been interviewing for jobs and then at the end people will say, well, I'm gonna come to the office three days a week. It's like, well, we actually need you in that job. You need to actually be here. And so I, we've experienced as a, just an employer, um, I think, you know, so it is something we're going to have to, we're all having conversations. And one of the challenges goes to a point, you know, Laura was making before public in, institutions have a lot of very rigid rules. So now we have to go, we have to pivot from the idea you can't have part-time employees, like how does this work? And we are having, we're all playing catch up here in, in that. In terms of leadership though, of people who are coming back, I, I think the job of any effective leader of an institution is essentially to be that chief cheerleader. You've got to be here. You've got to walk the halls. You've got to walk the Zoom meetings that you've got to you know, go in for breakout rooms and just be present and be, talk about the mission and talk about the impact and remind people, like for us, we're here for the students. I mean, in the middle of a pandemic, Hunter got it, has its second road scholar. That's crazy, right? I mean, this is a, you know, an honor that mostly goes to the Ivy League and this is our second in four years. And this young man came from Nepal where he faced political persecution because his parents were Sherpas and they were on the wrong side of the Sherpa dispute, came to New York, moved to Queens, didn't speak any English, and he's a Rhodes Scholar. And in addition between being a human rights activist, he's also a baritone and his interview for human rights he started to sing, they, asked, they said, sing a little aria. So you can't make these stories up. It's just so inspiring. And that's, those are, I walk the halls reminding people that we help make it possible for Dave and we've got to keep going. But as I also said, I see that it's also listening now to the new reality. So I also have to hear what's important to people. Right. And we learned that, you know, you're going to have Zooms, there's going to be a cat, there's going to be a dog, there's going to be a baby. And we're just going to all kind of have a little laugh and we're going to try to focus on our work, but be less rigid. You know, before the pandemic, we didn't have cats and dogs and babies in our meetings. And now we do. And we're going to keep being serious, but we're also going to maybe just relax it a bit. So we're all, I think, learning together how to find this new normal. Um, but we're not going back to exactly where we were. And that you know, that is a challenge, particularly, as I said, in a public system with a lot of rules that, that have to be followed. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Rob. Um, I think our next question will come from Ashley Simonetta, Simonetti, excuse me for mispronunciation. Hi. Hi, Hi. President Rob. I'm very happy to be here with you guys. I Just a little introduction. Ashley Simonetti, I'm a current student at Baruch. Uh, communications major, and I work in real estate. Um, my question for you is, how have you built confidence and resiliency over the course of your career? It's a great question. I think it's fine, is, is holding yourself to a standard and then appreciating it when you can get the results. So if you can really lay out an agenda for yourself, be a little hard on yourself in the sense that you have real goals and real things you need to accomplish. 
and then can be able to appreciate yourself when you reach them. Um, that has been a very important thing. And the other part is really, it's never yourself. It's this team that you've built. And I feel one of the things I feel really proud of is I have people that I've worked with now 27 years. I have people who come to hunt with me from the Landmarks Commission. I have people who I met when I started at Hunter who I've incorporated into my team. And we, we finish each other's sentences and we call each other out uh, when we're not necessarily doing the right thing. But it's truly, you know, I don't know that your work has to be your best friends, but I do really believe that creating a team in the office where you can trust each other, you can learn from each other, you can poke each other sometimes um, is super important. So I just feel I am just so blessed with extraordinary people. And I watched it during this pandemic um, and I've watched it all over the other, you know, as I was saying to Laura, some of the other challenges, I forgot to throw in there the blackout once, um, you know, in the middle when the lights went out and Hunter had the only generator on the Upper East Side. So we kept ourselves open and we lit from the subway and we fed everybody. And, you know, it's like the things we've done as a community. And that's again, because we kept our senses of humor and we had a team and we had each other's back. And we have the sign, it's the students, stupid, right? It's like, you know, what do, why are you here, right? Why are you here? We have to, you know, we've got to support the next generation. And I'll, you know, and Laura with the, the, you know, the Hunter motto is Mihi Kora Futuri. And it stands for the, the care of the future is mine. And every year at graduation, I say to the students, um, whether you're going into real estate, you're going to the arts, you're going to something obvious that's a caring profession like nursing, it doesn't matter what profession, you have an obligation to this city and to this state that your taxpayer dollars, you know, you have on the screen invested in the public university to make this great education possible. You got this beautiful gift from the public and you've got to pay it forward in whatever you do and whatever you do, you have to give back. And I think that's been really a sustaining, you know, sense for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, for that question. Um, and I just want to reiterate my thanks to all of you who joined us this morning. You know, I've been involved with ABNY for a few years. It is without fail every time I get together with this group, whether it's for a coffee or a cocktail or a boardroom breakfast or a what's on tap. I truly leave feeling so much more inspired and connected and proud to live in New York and proud to care about the city that we all you know, participate in together and, and try, strive every day to make better. So thank you to all of you for joining. And, and most importantly, President Rob, thank you so much for setting aside this hour. We, It is not lost on us that you have a million and one things to do every single day and committing an hour to talk to us here this morning was really, really a joy. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you for your, your tremendous number of years of public service. Um, and, and shaping the young minds that are going to move us forward for generations to come. So thank you so much, Melva, Sarah, Laura from Abney. Thank you everyone for getting us here today. I'll say it was an honor, an honor to be with you and, and please let Hunter know how we can keep helping and supporting the YPs and all of Abney. Awesome. And before we turn it over to Sarah to close us out, um, I'd just like to acknowledge another uh, Abney uh, Foundation board member, Bob Lehrman is on the call. Uh, <laughs> he has been a He's the youngest professional around. Absolutely. <laughs> he is the one who has taught me so much uh, and has been a, a really engaged uh, member of ABNY for a very, very, very long time. I won't say the, say the amount of years, but we really appreciate all the work he does, along with President Rapp, to make sure that uh, this organization continues to move forward and continues to grow. So thank you for joining your colleague today, uh, Bob. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Well, thank you, Melva. Thank you, Bob, so much for joining us. Thank you, Laura, for being an A-plus moderator and host. Um, we always appreciate your, your many years on the ABNY Steering Committee as well. So thank you on the YP Steering Committee. Um, President Rob, we are so, so lucky to have you um, as an engaged ABNY member as, and as just like a leader in the city. So we really, really appreciate everything you do for New York and um, this was so wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today and hope to see you all soon. Very fun. Thank you.